Today is November 15th, 2021, and we are joined by economist Tyler Goods Goodspeed from, from the Hoover Institution. Before Hoover, Tyler was a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, including a stinted act acting chairman. Tyler, welcome to Policy McCombs. Good to be here. Uh, let's start by telling us a little bit about your path to the CEA, the, the Council of Economic Advisors, and maybe telling the listeners a little bit about what, what that is, what that body does. Sure. So I had just before joining the Council of Economic Advisors in September 2017, uh, I'd been on the Faculty of Economics uh, over at Oxford in the UK and a lecturer at King's College London. And my spouse and I had sort of been wanting to move back to the US. And my spouse was going to be doing a master's degree at, at, at Harvard. So DC, Boston was a little bit easier than, than London. Uh, uh, D DC to Cambridge was a lot easier than, the uh, from than, than, than Oxford, London to, to Cambridge. And also, I'd always wanted to spend some time in policy. Uh, I'd supported a lot of what, what uh, the president's economic agenda stood for. And so, and also 2017 struck me as, a, as an interesting time to, 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 to dabble in policy, but it was only supposed to be for a year. Uh, but then after a year, I was sort of working on uh, implementing tax reform, a lot of regulatory things, digital services taxation issues were heating up. So I thought I had a lot of projects going on that I figured I should probably see through to, to conclusion. And then uh, 2019, uh, Kevin Hassett, who was the, the, the chairman of the council, he left. He and I had worked together on a lot of things. Uh, so in some sense, for some continuity, we thought it'd be good to, if I stayed on as a member, so I was elevated to member, I was only I was only going to be there until early 2020, and then COVID hit, and I thought, well, I don't want to be one of those people who leaves in the middle of a once-in-a-century pandemic and biggest economic recession since the, since 1932. So I stayed on and, and was elevated to, to acting chairman. Um, so the Council of Economic Advisors is it's kind of a unique institution. Uh, there aren't many other countries that have this sort of institution where in the executive office sits an organization of academic economists. Uh, so economists who are either on leave from academic institutions or are detailed over to the executive office from uh, various federal agencies like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Federal Reserve. And our job is basically to be sort of like an in-house uh, in house ref. Uh, to call balls and strikes that, like, that on economic matters. Now, that's a, that's a good idea. That's a bad idea. Um, and also to do a lot of analysis when there's a policy thing that people are considering, uh, when there's a hurricane coming toward, toward the, the Atlantic coast, what are the potential economic impacts of that? Um, and there's a lot of day-to-day -day scrambling in terms of trying to put, put reliable numbers, reliable estimates on, on a lot of policy issues and a lot of macroeconomic in, uh, impacts. And the chair sits on the on the sort of meetings with the president directly? Is that, that how typically takes place with the secretaries and everything? And, and if there are questions coming from whatever discussion, the chair sort of tries to address that. That's the, the their role at that point. Yes. Yeah, so the chair represents the council in principal level meetings and meetings with the president. And I, in the Trump administration, it was the economics team consisted of the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, the Treasury Secretary, the director of the National Economic Council. The National Economic Council sort of there to make sure that there's coordination between all different economic players in an administration and to handle external messaging. Um, and then also in our administration, we had uh, the director of the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy and uh, the U.S. Trade Representative and and often the, the, the Secretary of, the, of Department of Commerce. Um, and, you know, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, not listening, you can notice that Tyler is young. <laughs> so were you the youngest person in the room? How did that, you know, it must have been like a kind of a super interesting experience and, and, and early in your career. It, it was very interesting. Uh, I was the youngest person in the room. <laughs> I was the youngest, I think, in that position ever. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I think we try to look younger. Uh, <laughs> for, for three, four years, I was definitely trying to look older. Uh, and, and certainly the experience helped because I, I went in without gray hairs. And, <laughs> and now they're starting to populate back here. And just to close the loop on that, what was your background in terms of uh, what were you studying uh, as a, when in, in your career as a professor? And, of course, now back into academia. Right. So in, in a former life and now again, a current life, uh, I've, my specialty is economic history uh, and looking in particular at um, how in different times and in different places, financial markets uh, sometimes amplify 
the transmission of adverse shocks to the real economy, and sometimes they attenuate uh, those uh, the, the the transmission of adverse shocks to the real economy. Um, so that research agenda sort of took me to uh, 18th century Scotland, which uh, had a very competitive uh, banking system, and for 130 years, despite the fact that Scotland was a rapidly emerging economy uh, with a fixed exchange rate, with a large external debt, um, with chronic trade account deficit financed by large but highly volatile capital inflows. I mean, if you were looking at this, you would have thought, my God, this, you know, get ready, IMF. I right. obviously don't mind <laughs> IMF then, but uh, this, this, this is a tinderbox. And yet for 130 years in Scotland, uh, you had one financial crisis, um, during which in, in England, across the border, uh, you had, I think, no fewer than six. Um, it also took me to 1840s Ireland uh, to look at the role of access to small loan credit in terms of mitigating um, an adverse environmental shock. Uh, this was during the famine? This was during the famine okay. in, in the 1840s, uh, in 1840s Ireland. And then it also took me, and I'll be speaking about this here at UT today, uh, to 19th century U.S. banking, uh, which is a, sort of a, labor a great laboratory uh, for analyzing the effects of different types of financial regulation because you can look at, because each state was sort of doing its own thing, so you can look at, okay, if you were a bank on this side of a border with this regulatory treatment right, right. versus a bank on the other side of the border with a different regulatory treatment, what were the outcomes? So a crazy question. Um, do you see any connections between that? We had different kinds of money, right? Also during the time, we, there was a lot of like different issuers of currency and so on. Do you see any lessons from that period that the world we live in now with the idea that there's the central decentralized financing, different kinds of digital currencies and digital coins and so on? Any things that, that, that pop up? I mean, this is like a, yeah. if you don't have an answer to that, that's totally fine. It just came to my mind. Well, I see a lot of, truth be told, I see a lot of similarities between a lot of the, the current generation of stable coins and what was the, the standard the standard model of banking for much of U.S. history, for much of history, uh, which is, you know, you, you issue a liability that is redeemable on demand uh, at a certain peg, uh, and you, you back that, that liability by holding certain assets. And in the case of a lot of stable coins, they, are very, they might be very, very safe assets. You know, you're talking about uh, highly liquid T-bills right. or bonds right. or whatever. You know, at the end of the day, you're still a bank. Like, that looks, like, <laughs> that looks and walks and talks like, like a bank. Um, as I said, it could be a very safe bank, um, but it kind of re resembles to me actually some of the early instances of like gold goldsmith banking. Interesting. Um, all right, let's turn back to the to the experience in the CEA, and and uh, it seems that the, that you, the CEA that you were part of was laser focused on growth. Growth being like a operative word, and pretty much all the policies and ideas coming out during that time. And I, whether it was said by internally or externally, we can talk about that. But um, so what do you see? You were involved, I guess, in the tax reform of 2017. Um, and at that point, prior to the bill or even and after the bill, how did the CA, your work, assess the, the potential benefits of the bill beforehand and costs, I suppose? And, and how did it turn out after it actually got implemented? It was December 17th that passed, right? Yep, December so 22nd. What were you hoping and what, what actually happened? Uh, or what would you assess the, 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 the consequences of it? Mm. So I think we were, when, when we entered the CEA in 2017, we were studying the expansion, the recovery from 2009 through 2016 a lot. Uh, the recovery from the, great, from the global financial crisis began July 2009. And there were a couple of interesting anomalies about that recovery that we observed. Uh, one was that the prime age labor force in the United States, so people between the ages of 25 and 54, shrank. Okay. And actually shrank by 1.6 million workers, uh, despite the fact that that, that population, tw the folks 25 to 54 years old, that, that population continued to grow. But the number of them who were participating in the labor force shrank by 1.6 million. Another anomaly that we noticed was that the Sorry to get technical. The, the contribution of capital deepening to labor productivity growth actually turned negative uh, for several years during that period, which was almost unprecedented in, in post-war U.S. history. Meaning, so, me, me, okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Meaning, uh, firms' gross investment in new plant and equipment per worker was insufficient to keep pace with depreciation of existing capital per worker. 
And so when we were working on the, the 2017 tax law, there were a couple of things we wanted to do. One was to lower both absolutely, but also relatively, the cost of capital in the United States relative to other advanced economies where we had, among advanced economies, the, the highest effective corporate tax rate uh, uh, in the, it, among, among that, that cohort. Um, and we did that both by lowering the statutory corporate income tax rate and by introducing full expensing of new equipment investments. So if you invested in a you know, five or seven year uh, a, a new piece of equipment with a five or seven year asset life, you could immediately write that off. Um, and the other thing is on the individual side, uh, certainly one priority was simplification, but another was that you, we want to, there, in the United States tax code, there are a lot of tax expenditures. Uh, often very inefficient, often highly skewed toward the highest income tax brackets. Mm -hmm. um, so we were trying to to eliminate or cap a lot of those tax expenditures and then plow the savings into marginal personal income tax rate reductions, which can have a positive effect at the margin, mm -hmm. can have a positive effect on, on labor force participation, particularly among older workers. And that, that was really a big tailwind uh, to, to U.S. growth prospects is the fact, uh, sorry, headwind uh, to U.S. growth pro prospects was the, the fact that the peak baby boom generations were starting to enter retirement. Um, and so we, we did things like, we, like cap the deduction for state and local taxes, uh, which is a tax expenditure that massively accrues to the highest income tax brackets, particularly in high tax states. You're helping, you're helping folks with expensive houses in California and New York, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. And similarly with the mortgage interest deduction. Um, and then we lowered marginal personal income tax rates. We raised the standard deduction, uh, which among other things, helps smooth some of those effective marginal tax rates as people enter the, the workforce and, and, and start to earn. So those, that was some of the thinking that went into it. Um, there was to get, because it was, it was a narrowly divided Senate, mm -hmm. and so to get enough votes under reconciliation, I, there had to be a lot of uh, a lot of compromise. One compromise was a substantial increase in the child tax credit, um, doubled the child tax credit, and expanded eligibility for it. Now, the interesting thing about how we designed the child tax credit, because the child tra tax credit can be kind of tricky. Uh, for one thing, as it phases out, it raises effective marginal tax rates on individuals. And it phases out on income basis, an income test. Right? It phases okay. out on, on an income basis, yes. Um, now, and if you increase the child tax credit, then that means that, incre that, that implicit marginal tax rate is even higher. Right. However, on the other hand, as it phases in, it helps to offset the phase out of the earned income tax credit. Um, so it can lower marginal implicit marginal tax rates as it phases in and those things might balance out but the way we designed it was that it phased in uh, only on earned income and it was and it was refundable on earned income so even if you you had a net tax liability of zero you could still qualify for the child tax credit um, on earned income on the basis of earned income uh, I think a tricky thing is when you make it fully refundable, meaning you don't have to be earning income, meaning you don't have to be working, then you lose that that effective employment subsidy. And I think on net, you're probably going to get a decline in labor force participation. And that's a, a big component of the current law that's been proposed, right? He's taking away that. Correct. Right, right, right. The phasing in part. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, so in terms of hopes and aspirations, once, once you know, the law was being passed, I guess one of the biggest thing would be, all right, hopefully this is going to you know, stimulate uh, uh, investment in capital, and hopefully capital is going to come back to be uh, an addition to, to, to total factor productivity in a way that, that does not just offsetting the loss in the, the labor side, right? That's mm -hmm. what we said. Um, and then how did it turn out? So I think, uh, I mean, if we, look at, if we look at labor, I think it was a tremendous success. Um, so remember I said that from July 2009 through December 2016, 1.6 million prime age Americans left the labor force. Uh, in the subsequent three years, 2.3 million of them entered or re-entered the labor force. Uh, we saw, whereas previously during the expansion, uh, we saw wage gains for the bottom 10% lag that of the top 10%, wage gains for, for workers lag that of managers, wage gains for African Americans and non-white Americans lag that of white Americans. 
uh, wage growth for those without a college degree, lag that of those with a college degree. Uh, in the aftermath of 2017, we saw all those trends reverse. Um, and in one year alone, 2019, we actually saw real inflation adjusted uh, median household income increase by $4,400, which was more in one year than cumulatively in the 16 years uh, through through 2016. So just staggering gains uh, in the labor market. And we, we, in late 2019, we had a state of affairs in which three quarters, fully 75% of the flows into employment were individuals coming in from out of the labor force, uh, which is pretty staggering when you think about it. And on the capital side, so we had predicted at the, at the Council of Economic Advisors, we did a huge survey of all these estimates of, of how responsive investment demand is to changes in the cost of capital. Uh, and on that, the base of that big literature, we, we estimated that there would be a, a 9% increase um, in the demand for capital services uh, that would raise, raise the future productive capital stock of the United States, and that feeds through to productivity. Um, as it turns out, if you estimate a trend in the growth in, in business investment in mm -hmm. the United States uh, over the period from 2009, started the expansion in 2009 through 2016, actually you can even extend the sample into 2017 uh, just before the, the, the tax law, project that trend into 2018, 2019, calculate the, the difference. Delta. And uh, real private non-residential fixed investments, so real business investment had risen 10% over that trend uh, by the end of 2019. Um, so I think that, that was, that was an, a, a point of evidence that, that on the business investment side, the, the, the law was, the, was working as planned. Um, and uh, we were starting to see that feed through into productivity. So in 2018, 2019, the U.S. growth in, in productivity. Uh, which growth, has been stalled for a long time, right? Which had been, yeah. yes, uh, which had been slowing for a long time and stalling in sort of 2009 to 2016. That increased from about 1.1%, 1.1% uh, average during the preceding recovery to about 1.5%, 1.6% uh, in 2018, 2019. And the U.S. was the only... G7 economy to observe its productivity growth rate increase in 2018, 2019 right. relative to the preceding uh, eight or so years. Uh, so I think I think when we look at both the capital side and the labor side, uh, the, the the 2017 tax law was was having uh, most of the desired effects. And uh, that also translated to growth, right? The the growth picked up quite a bit in those years relative to the trend since 2009. Correct. We're now crossing three percent growth and and so on. Right? Correct. It it increased. Both in absolute terms, um, modestly, but in absolute terms, the growth rate increased. But more importantly, it increased relative to trend. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you know, if, if, if one doesn't, uh, if one, one, one could disagree with the trend analysis. I think another thing to do is simply to look at what the Congressional Budget Office That's were predict, predicting back in August 2016, which is the, their last uh, sort of pre pre-Trump administration forecast, and uh, I'm going to get the I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, um, but uh, I think the U.S. economy was about 300 billion dollars bigger uh, at the end of 2019 than they had projected, uh, and we had added five million more jobs than they had projected, <clears throat> and actually in just two months alone, January February 2020 before COVID hit, the U.S. economy added more jobs than the CBO had predicted they would add in, in all 40, 12 months of, yeah. of 2020. 2020, right. Um, all right, so that, that, that brings me to my next question of things are working as well as, probably as well as they could, of course, but, but like working really well, better than they have been working in quite a while on the economic front. We're growing, real income is growing. Uh, it's growing for the lower strata of the population, for different minorities, it's growing really well. So things are working really well relative to the period from 2009 onwards that you that you mentioned here and yet you have this sort of national gloom and doom rhetoric out there so uh, i don't think there's you can find a lot of positive you know news economic news in in the typical what they call these days msm the mainstream media <laughs> right <laughs> um and it must be 
an interesting experience to be seeing those numbers internally, seeing what the impact of the policies you've been working on have been having in real people's lives. And yep. yet, you know, you're constantly being attacked for not doing enough or whatever it is that, that that's coming out of the record. So, so what what is the sort of attitude at that point in terms of, you know, do you try to, to do better PR on the effort or, or to see like, well, that's not our job. We're not going to worry about this. Or was that part of the trying to communicate that better? Uh, you know, economists are not necessarily great at communicating <laughs> ideas out to the, real, to the public. So well, what was the mood internally on that? That's a good question. And I, I would say by and large the mood was staying focused on the jobs because there was a lot going on. We were trying to to steer the, the phase one negotiations with China through to successful conclusion. We were trying to get uh, the renegotiated USMCO, USMCA over the finish line. We had a lot of other things that, that were going on. Um, we certainly did try and aspire to just get the information out there um, because I think it's important for the national discourse that you have an honest, uh, data-driven conversation about right. what the effects of policy are. And it was very disappointing to me uh, with with the, the 2017 tax law that, that there did seem to be an unwillingness to talk about a lot of the, the palpable, observable uh, benefits of, of, of that, that, that tax change. Um, I will say the mood was, I mean, there's always an elevated level of anxiety, I think, in that in that <laughs> job. in that environment, in that job, and you know, whenever the yield curve inverts, that uh, that further elevates the anxiety. Although I think in 2019 we were we were sufficiently confident that a yield curve inversion in the context of of scaling down asset purchases and eight plus years of unconventional monetary policy, the yield curve doesn't didn't mean what it used, what it historically meant. Um, but it was, it was always uplifting to speak to small business groups, to speak to uh, minority business groups, um, because they were telling us a much different story than what we were hearing from, from, from the dominant media. Um, and we would meet often with folks from the Institute for Supply Management. We would meet often with folks from the National Federation of Independent Businesses, and which represents thousands of, of small businesses. And the folks at, at, at the National Federation of Independent Businesses were saying, you know, this is we haven't seen this ever. That for the first time, basically ever, our our members are telling us that the biggest problems they are facing right now have nothing to do with government. Because historically, it would be regulation, it would be taxes, it would be um, it, it would be competition policy. But what, their their number one thing issue in, in at the end of twenty nineteen was uh, was 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 getting labor, getting skilled labor, and we were happy with that because, as I said, we were it's seeing put pressure on, on wages. And we, we right, were, right. it was genuine right, right. pressure on wages, right. um, and it was pulling. 2.3 million prime-age Americans back, back in the labor work. force. Mm-hmm. So that's January, 20, uh, January, February 2020. Things are going really well. And then COVID hits. Um, lockdowns are coming down fast. All these unprecedented measures that I don't think anybody had time or, or, or historical ability to study the potential consequences. Um, I, mean, I, I joke that I, I am like really excited to now understand how big businesses in America are able to do what they did during that time because for the most part, you know, things were there, packages arrived, and <laughs> which is amazing. But that wasn't secu- We didn't know that was going to happen. We didn't know it was going to happen given the restraints put in place. So what was the focus at that point in time? What was, were you thinking internally? Like, what do we need to do to really try to understand this and measure the cost-benefit analysis and, and t- try to provide some some at least, you know, uh, balls and strikes, as you pointed out, of okay. here's what's going to happen or potentially going to happen doing this, this, that, and the other. Yeah. So I think the first two things we did immediately um, at, the, at the deputy level, because well, I was then, a, I was then a, a deputy of my agency, um, and then just, just after COVID hit, um, became acting chair, the first thing we did was to start getting as much data as we could, real-time data. Um, I mean, all these sorts of things that we now, you know, the, 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 the foot traffic, mm-hmm. the business openings data, credit card spending data, um, and then also take, make an assessment of what are the tools at our disposal that we can activate now. 
Um, obviously, we want to also work with Congress right. to get to get. We're going to need a lot of legislation. Um, but also, what are some of the disaster relief tools that we have at our disposal? Some of the the small business loans, disaster, you know, the economic injury and disaster loans, all these these thing tools that we may have to get thing to to get relief support out now quickly. That was that happened very very early on, uh, and I remember some long long weekends. Uh, and regrettably, those weekends meant that I wasn't able to get a haircut before everything <laughs> shut down. <laughs> um, but then uh, the next step was to really, we were really thinking about, okay, what, what is the nature of this shock? And we realized that, first of all, un, unlike in 2008, we felt that on the eve of this shock, U.S. factors of production, capital, labor, were for the most part efficiently allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we wanted to, be, to, to help preserve those allocations, preserve the matches of employers with employees, uh, and help preserve some of the organizational capital that's embedded in a lot of businesses, particularly small businesses. Because if, if, if those firms become insolvent, all that capital is lost and it can take a long time to reconstitute. And, and all the while, uh, markets for goods and labor will be operating at less than, less than full capacity. So we wanted to help preserve those matches. Um, and then also, especially as, 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 negotiate, as, as work got underway with Congress, uh, you know, we, are, we were looking at 20 million Americans becoming unemployed all at once, right. um, and consumer spending is 70% of the U.S. economy, and so there was a, a sense that you know we to have 20 plus million Americans becoming unemployed all at once, and and that that means they're losing 50% of their income because state regular UI unemployment insurance benefits only replace 50% of uh, of lost income. So that's why when we started working with Congress. Um, in addition to the, the Paycheck Protection Program, in addition to the Employee Retention Tax Credit, which were designed to help preserve those matches of employers and employees, uh, we also uh, worked on the, the economic impact payments to households and increasing the replacement rate on, um, on lost income. Our own view was we should try to make sure that replacement rate doesn't go above 100%. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these state unemployment insurance systems are incredibly outdated. I mean, they're running on like Cobalt and you know, old programming languages, and they couldn't do that, uh, which is why we ended up with just a, a fixed amount huh. of the, the top up. And um, all right, so then, then things kept going, and warp speed started working. Where that a role the CA played? Because there was a... You guys had had a briefing before even the pandemic, right? Thinking about what to do in a situation like that. There was a, some some study of that of that. Of, I don't know if that was a, um, associated with the potential respiratory, respiratory virus or not. Or it was actually. It was actually it was okay. Respiratory, okay. Uh, flu. It was flu. Yeah. Okay. Thinking about a flu pandemic. Yep. All right. And 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 there were some linings of ideas of how to fastly react to provide the safe access to a vaccine. Um, what was that connection? Was that a uh, so that there was a group established to try to create warp speed, right? Yep. Was CA involved in that at all? And those ideas were were put forward. So I think that uh, that that paper had an important impact on the pandemic response at two points in time. One was when the administration was contemplating the initial uh, suspension of travel from from China. Uh, that was so that was very early on, and the. The public health bureaucracy felt that they, they were not in support of, of travel bans, um, but CEA actually worked with um, uh, Dr. Navarro's office, um, looking at the, the, the whole the meta literature on on travel bans. And travel bans can't stop mm -hmm. a virus coming. I mean, it's a virus. But what what travel restrictions can do is they can delay the peak, which can be really quite valuable. If during the intervening period you can develop a vaccine or develop advanced therapeutics or stockpile uh, personal protective equipment, um, and that can be very val valuable. And even if you're only mitigating the severity by you know 0.1 percent or less, given the magnitude of the costs that we estimated in mm -hmm. that that flu paper, in that vaccines paper we did, um, it can be worthwhile. The second point at which that paper really helped influence policy was with Operation Warp Speed um, to really drive home to, to principles that, that 
yes, it may be expensive. And yes, there may be some some failures that some of these candidates that we're throwing money at might not succeed. Um, but given the magnitude of the costs, if we can truncate this pandemic even just a few months early by accelerating the arrival of the vaccine, it is it is worth it. It passes any any sensible cost benefit analysis. Um, and but but massive credit to to Secretary Azar. Uh, to Jared Kushner and to the president for for, for recognizing that and, and really really getting it over the finish line. Yeah, when you say, when you say uh, uh, the cost benefit there, I think that there were a couple of pe people that I respect a lot writing. Um, I think it was Tabarrok kept saying the costs are in the billions, the benefits are in the trillions. So it's just Correct. like it, it, yep. it's, it's that simple, yep. right? Yep. Um, excellent. Okay, so let's move to now and what are the current economic conditions? First, I mean, did you expect the recession to be so they recovered to be so fast, and you're going to talk a little bit about that later today. Um, I am, I am, I'm still puzzled. One of the things that I'm puzzled by is that growth has been pretty strong still. Mm -hmm. Last quarter, maybe not so much, right? Uh, but with all the things that you hear about supply disruptions and shortages and uh, labor force participation and so on, how is it that we are, are still growing at, at 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 this fast pace? Is there something yeah. about productivity that still maybe the coming from from the, the, the good things in 2017 and 18 that allows us to more quickly uh, uh, create things without without the same amount of goods and maybe and, and, and people employed? Uh, terrific question. It, the, the, the speed of the recovery did also surprise me. Uh, and actually, when early in 2020, the, the OECD estimated that the U.S. economy during the four quarters of 2020 would contract would would end 2020 12.2% smaller uh, than 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 at the start of 2020, um, and the CBO were projecting that the unemployment rate would remain above 10% through the end of the year, and said we were I think we ended the year at like 6.7%. Mm -hmm. um, the broadest measure of labor market underutilization, so-called U6, uh, ended 2020 at a lower level than it was in August 2014. Um, so I think. There were a number of, and, and as you know, I mean, it was, it was two months, officially, MBE, the National Bureau of Economic Research dated it as a, as a two-month recession, even though obviously a lot of pain right, continued right. much longer than that. I, th I think there are a couple factors behind the, the, the speed and strength of the recovery. Uh, one was that things were, as I said earlier, for the most part, efficiently allocated. So when you have something like the Paycheck Protection Program, when you have something like the Employee Retention Tax Credit, and when you have something like the change in the treatment of net operating losses, that was something else that we did in CARES Act, which, which doesn't get talked about at all. But basically, we said if you have a net operating loss uh, as a business in 2020, you can now carry that loss back to 2018 or 2019, when presumably you had a pretty healthy profit. Right. And, and get a tax refund on that. Now, what's, what was really good about that is that, first of all, it means it helps cushion the, the shock to cash flow in this unprecedented year of 2020. Um, but it also does so at relatively low budget cost because if these firms survived, that net, net operating loss was always going to be a tax asset of theirs in the future. Even, and even if they failed, right. it would have become right. a tax asset un, under, under right. liquidation. Right. Right. Um, so I think that really helped a lot of these firms to weather this adverse shock. And the PPP, ERTC help maintain those connections between employers and employees so that when things started reopening, we were in a much better position to go back to where we were. I mean, I think what also helped was the, the strength of the labor market on the eve of the shock because we did some simulations where we basically simulated the 2020 shock with uh, December 2016 probabilities of flows right, right, and, right. and uh, probabilities of transitions between different states of employment or unemployment um, and the unemployment rate that prevailed then and and it would have been worse with that sort of labor market. That's what I was going to ask. I would love to see a paper telling me the causal effect of the counterfactual of like, okay, had we not had the 2017 law, what would the shock be like and the recovery be like yeah. relative to having had that, being a position where you're very strong, markets, not only yeah. capital and labor markets are very strong, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those are higher quality matches because right. of right. Uh, you know, 24 months at or, or, at or below 4% unemployment. Um, so and, yeah. not, and not to defend an administration, but you know, I think that the the the, the, the rhetoric is going to be that 
Trump made it worse. And I don't know, I think the, the, the measures that were put in place in 2017 in particular might have actually made it, the, our ability to mitigate a lot, a lot, a lot stronger, right? Yeah. yeah. But I like the, uh, what Bob Lucas that says, once you start thinking about growth, nothing else matters. <laughs> and, and that's one of those examples of, of the growth that was generated put us in a much better position to fight the, the situation that we encounter yes. ourselves in. All right, so let's look now at what's happening in terms of, of, of policies that, that, you know, I think the two main things that we, we hear a lot about is supply disruptions. Again, we have now a CEA and, a, and an administration that I think generally supply is not their efforts ever, thinking about mm-hmm. supply side things, but also growth is not ever a, a, a word that comes out mm-hmm. of, of, I mean, maybe I'm exa- exaggerating, tend to do that. <laughs> uh, but, but, but in terms of the, the relative use of that word, for sure, your time, the CAs and the Republicans tend to be more focused on growth and Democrats not so much, right? Um, but we have this big constraint in place right now, whatever the supply disruptions are, mm-hmm. and inflation, the two things coming at the same time. Um, so kind of like resembling a bit of the stagflation mm-hmm. sprouts of, of the 70s. Uh, do you see a connection to that, number one? And two, uh, in terms of policies put in place right now, how do you see this playing out mm-hmm. given the current circumstances? So one of the things that that really strikes me when I look at the current macro data is that we seem to be observing all of the signs of a very tight labor market. When we when you look at quit rates, when you look at vacancy rates, when you look at nominal wage growth, it looks like a tight labor market but it is a tight labor market while we are still more than 4 million jobs short of where we were in February 2020 and between 7 and 8 million jobs short of where we would be had we continued at a pre-pandemic trend. The labor force participation rate fell very sharply in March and April 2020. By August of 2020, we had recovered half of that decline Since August 2020, the labor force participation rate has been flat, and actually it's ticked down a a little bit. Um, So on the labor side, I'm very concerned about whether whether we just have now lower potential. Because by my estimations, we have had between 1.3 and 1.6 million early retirements. And given the tax policies on the horizon, at the very least, if if the current administration allows a lot of the personal income tax rate reductions from the 2017 tax law to to expire, to sunset, I don't necessarily see a lot of those early retirements coming, being enticed back into the labor force. Um, The current administration has done a big increase in the child tax credit. Mm -hmm. The phase out applies earlier. So that means more workers are affected by those higher implicit marginal tax rates as it phases out. And they've made it fully refundable, meaning there's no longer a work requirement. So I think there, there are some big headwinds to continued recovery in labor force participation, which is going to make it difficult to ease some of those supply side pressures. Because if you speak with people on the ground, I spoke at length with, uh, with a, the chief procurement officer of a major truck leasing company who also runs the monthly uh, Institute for Supply Management uh, Manufacturing Survey, he says, and, and others surveyed say, um, I mean, the labor problem is is just acute across the supply chain. Turnover is so high. Absenteeism is so high. The younger workers that they're hiring to replace these early retirees are just not, not, as, not, not as skilled. Um, and, and so that's all on the labor side. Um, and I don't see policy necessarily doing much to help, and in fact, because some of that is just a trend caused by COVID, and and you know not necessarily by policy, correct, right? Correct. But policy is not coming in trying to reverse that. In, fa- in fact, is trying to is moving more in that direction. Correct. Um, and then the other s- bigger, I mean, we, we focus a lot on you know autos and chip shortages. I mean, from folks I've spoken to, that's about a two year process mm-hmm. that we're about a year and a quarter into. Um, but it's, it's bigger than autos. It's bigger than chips because if you look at overall business investment, uh, by my estimates, cumulatively since the pandemic began, we've had about a $1.8 trillion shortfall in private non-residential fixed investment relative to trend. Now, $1.8 trillion, that's about 3% of the U.S. capital stock. Capital output ratio of three, that means potential output is about 1% lower. 
Um, so that's I, I think that's another big big headwind um, for and, for potential and, output. Right, and if policy is considering raising capital, uh, the, the the corporate tax rate, um, and maybe sunsetting some of the expenditure, uh, uh, right? Correct. So the 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 current the current provision current the, the law, undo both, right? Yeah. Current law, uh, the proposal. The, full expensing, the proposal. Right. So yes, yeah, so under under the 2017 tax law, the the full expensing of equipment investments starts to phase out after 2022. Okay. That was a part um, of the the sort of scoring and, and paying for it, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Making sure that we saved within the the budget authorization over over 10 year period. Right. Um, but yes, the current administration is is proposing to to increase the statutory. Uh, corporate tax rate, uh, which will raise the cost, will at the margin raise the cost of capital, and deter com- d- domestic capital formation. Um, and at the very least, there's just uncertainty. I mean, is it going up? Is it not going up? Um, that really raises the the real option value of just okay, wait and see. Um, but but that's I, th- I think you add these things up, and it's a it is a, a, a substantial hit to potential output. And it's a substantial hit to potential output at the same time that the administration is proposing a, a lot of continued stimulus on the demand side. Right, right. Um, and then, of course, that, that's that's uh, in the inflation side, right? So you, you, you're you constraining one side, pushing the other one. So it's hard to think about, regardless of the Federal Reserve's actions here, unless it, they go in and start reading very draconian on the demand side. It's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's creating, it's potentially creating some, some real challenges for the monetary authority because you have a, a supply side that it has less potential than it did before. You have increased demand with substantial increases in federal government transfers to households. That's going to put a lot of upward pressure on prices, and the Federal Reserve is going to have to decide, do we accommodate this, even if it means uh, higher inflation? Or do we not accommodate this, and you know, at the risk of, of higher unemployment? I think that they're they're putting fiscal policy is putting monetary policy in a very tricky situation. All right, let's talk a bit about your talk later this afternoon. Then um, you want to tell us about the tale of two the tales of two recoveries, contrasting 2009, the recovery after 2009, and the recovery after 2020. We talk a little bit about that, but what are the things you will highlight later on? Um, yeah, so I th- actually, I think we, we covered a lot of that ground just in terms of the, the, the anomalies of the, the aftermath of, of 2009. Uh, actually, Milton Friedman had a model of business cycle fluctuations called the, the, the plucking model. It was rather like plucking the bow on a, uh, the string on a bow. Uh, the, the amplitude of a contraction is very highly correlated with the amplitude of the subsequent expansion. And when you look over the past 150 years of U.S. history, we, we see that pattern borne out by the data um, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, and actually, that, that pattern is even stronger uh, when a contraction, economic contraction, is accompanied by a financial crisis. Uh, there are a couple of few exceptions over the past 150 years. One was the Great Depression. One was the relatively mild recession in the early 1990s. And the third was 2009. the aftermath of 2008-2009. Um, and I think some of that was just the nature of that shock. It was a, it, w- it was a, a very severe financial shock. Um, you had, you know, at least in, in 2008, you had major credit disintermediation. You had a lot of factor reallocation that needed to go on. But I think a lot of the challenge, too, was, was the policy response that, that is, as my former colleague Casey Mulligan has written a book on this, the raised... redistribution recession, is that correct? Right, right. Yes. So raised implicit marginal tax rates on the return to work. Um, you had a lot of financial regulatory requirements that decreased the, the net 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 effect of which was to decrease the availability of credit, particularly to small and medium sized enterprises. My current colleague Mike Bordeaux uh, has a very good paper about out on on this, um, and we maintained the a, a very high relative cost of capital and and absolutely high cost of capital. Um, which, in combination with an increased regulatory burden, deterred a lot of capital formation. And I think in 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, we saw a lot of unpicking of some of those some of those those constraints on 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 potential growth. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, I hope you see you back at CA soon. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Great to be with you. All right.